Okay, moving to our uh, next uh, speaker on the topic, uh, which is just moving along the conversation that we're having this afternoon, is uh, Dave Caddy. Dave Caddy is the Executive Vice President uh, with the MDA. MDA is uh, one of Canada's uh, uh, not only largest uh, uh, companies, but also one of the best known uh, because of uh, what it has meant to our uh, national uh, brand. Uh, uh, and, and they're the producers of the Canada arm and uh, all of the uh, space robotic arms, which uh, all Canadians have taken great deal of pride on. Um, Dave has been with the company since 1986 and has grown through the various ranks uh, to the where he is. And I'm delighted that in the last few years he has uh, 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 focused his attention in the field of medical robotics. It is something that uh, he's going to talk to us a little bit about what he thinks the challenges of taking uh, such innovations to market. Clearly, he has gone through that with the satellite business, with the, with the space robotic business, even though his customers were uh, relatively small but paying well. But now, uh, focusing on the whole medical robotic business, what he thinks are, are the challenges in taking such innovation. Th thank you very much, Dave. Hello. <clears throat> Not very often when you get to speak and follow a, a rock star, so uh, I haven't had this experience before, so I'll do my best. Also, I understand we're sort of running behind, so I'll go through this as quickly as I can. Um, when Dr. Invari asked me to speak, what he said was he wanted me to talk about MDA, and I said I'd like to also talk a little bit about innovation and how we try to get to market. So this is a sort of two-part two uh, presentation. But whenever anybody asks a space guy to stand up and brag about his company, we never miss the opportunity. So I'm going to spend about the first 20 minutes bragging about MDA and talking to you about what we do, and then a few minutes at the end about, about innovation. So the first uh, area that we got into in space was in orbital robotics. Um, what people wanted when it was, uh, as we started having astronauts, you heard the astronaut this morning talk about going out in space. Uh, you all know space is a very hostile environment. And so there's lots of times when you don't really want to put people out there. And so people came to us and said, could you build a robot, some kind of robot that would do things in space that humans would be doing? So when you think of our robotics, you have to take your mind away from the kind of industrial robots you might think about that are doing things over and over again repetitively and think about a different kind of robot that would do things that humans would want to do in somewhat unscripted uh, environments. So therefore, the robots as they evolve need to have things like a vision system. So you wouldn't think of us as the vision guys, but we have a vision system that's, that's very uh, high quality. It has to have, obviously, the mechanical part of it to be able to lift things and move things around. Um, but it also has to have a sense of touch so that it can, it can let you know it's feeling things and what's, what's happening out there. And in a way, it sort of has to have a, like the human-like qualities that you'd like so that the astronaut who's operating it or the people on the ground that are operating it uh, are almost like they're there. And therefore, it also has to have a great deal of smarts. Um, these, are, these are pictures here of some of our early robotics work. Uh, this is the icon of space, the Canada Arm, which uh, I think everybody's familiar with, and that was the first, uh, first of the, uh, of the uh, robotics that we built. What is interesting to me is when we built it, and I wasn't actually around at the time, but the requirements that NASA imposed on it to put it on the shuttle was very simple. And in fact, all they really saw it to do was to take cargo out of the cargo bay and, and put it out in space. And so fortunately for, our, uh, for us, our engineers had a little more vision than that and tried to create in it the kinds of smarts that I talked about, at least as many as we could at the time. And uh, one of the things that's quite interesting now is to see how comfortable that the astronauts are to be tethered on the end of this robotic arm and waved around in space. And so you've seen pictures of astronauts at the end of the arm. And I can assure you that when NASA paid for their, had the original design, there was no chance that an astronaut would ever have allowed himself to be on the arm. So kind of the reliability that had to be there. Uh, the Canada Arm 2 and the follow-on were much more complex and put in the sense of touch and improved on the vision system. And, you know, we've added booms that now can inspect the space shuttle. And so basically the, the manned flight for the United States, including space station, is really uh, dependent on, completely dependent on the, on the robotics that we, we developed. Um, the next generation, uh, we're working on the next generation. Um, the challenges there are to make things uh, obviously lighter, 
uh, smaller, so that they fit into smaller spacecraft. Uh, and so we're doing this sort of miniaturization, taking less power and so on. So we're in the middle of the development of the next generation of Canadar. Um, if you take these robotics and you imagine, well, where would we really go to commercialize? It's very difficult to find commercial applications for, for on-orbit robotics. One of the solutions that we've, we've been looking at is to do uh, servicing of spacecraft that are already in space. We've done a number of projects on that. Um, the first one was an orbital express program, and that involved uh, basically capturing another object in space, uh, you know, grappling with it, moving it, putting fuel on board, uh, repairing uh, equipment on board, and so on. And that was a demonstration mission which we worked with the uh, U.S. military on. We also did a, the other issue that you have to be able to do if you're going to do a repair in space is you have to be able to dock with other, other objects. And so this program here, XSS-11, was a rendezvous using a LIDAR, which is a, basically a laser that, that gives you range finding. Um, and MDA was a participant in that program and learned a lot about how to, uh, how to dock with uh, objects in space. Where was this leading us to? Um, in just in the geosynchronous orbit, which is the most valuable orbit in space, which is the orbit of, that lets satellites orbit and still look like they're appearing at the stationary above the Earth, uh, that's a very valuable piece of real estate in space. There are two or three hundred satellites in that particular orbit right now. Um, almost all of them are communication satellites. And so whenever you use your cell phone or whenever you turn on your TV and watch a, a you know, channel from somewhere else than, than local, uh, you're using one of those satellites. So it's it's in everybody's life now, these satellites. They have a design life of about 25 years, but they typically run out of fuel at about 15 years and become useless. You have to do very accurate station keeping so they don't move around. Um, so there is a market there to go up and put fuel on board these satellites. So we've been spending a lot of time thinking about how to do that and trying to figure out how to get into that market. And that's sort of one of our current activities. The next area that we got uh, uh, we've been involved in is planetary exploration. So this is kind of the exciting bits of uh, going up and, and exploring other planets and other objects. Um, done a lot of work there. Um, the first one is the NASA Phoenix mission I talked about, and this one's kind of interesting to us, and you can see in here what we did. We built the sort of weather station on this, on this mission. Uh, the funny story that, that we're, we tell is that, of course, this is a Canadian, Canadian technology, and so what do you think the first thing that the Met station just detected on Mars. We think it was snow. So it was typical of the Canadians that we would, we would discover snow, we would be the ones that disco discover snow on Mars. Um, the next one uh, is one that we're anticipating, and this is a, a you can see that the technology on board, including a robotic arm and a camera mechanism and so on, and this is due to land on Mars in, in the imminent time frame. Um, where is this one going in terms of is there any commercial nature to this? Um, you might have been reading some of the literature, some of the stories that have come out recently. There is uh, quite a bit of interest in trying to figure out how you could mine and ast mine asteroids. Um, there's a lot of expectation that asteroids contain a lot of valuable minerals, including some of the rare earths. And so uh, there's a lot of anticipation of could we build technologies that go out and commercially exploit asteroids, bringing things back that are, and so some of the early missions, and this talks about one, early missions where we're involved in trying to figure out how you would, how you would do that. Um, this is a whole list of other technologies that we've been involved in. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go through them. There's some very complicated technologies. And again, these are all the kinds of things that you need the, you need the capabilities of if you're gonna do planetary exploration.